Amen. All right, let's all stand this morning in honor of the Word of God. Open your Bibles to the book of Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5, verse number 8. Job chapter 5, verse number 8. This message this morning is, is twofold. It's, it's a bit of a uh, challenging message, but yet a sorrowful message in light of what's gone on this past week. I don't know if you keep up with the news, uh, but some things have happened in America that, that burden my heart. And as a pastor, I want to make sure that I get up and address and I challenge America what we can do. Job chapter 5, verse number 8, the Bible says, I would seek unto God... And unto God would I commit my cause. I want to preach to you a message this morning about what can change America. What can change America? Again, I don't know if you've known what's happened this last week. I'd like to talk a little bit about it and address it and how, as a church, where we stand. But America needs some change this morning. Amen. America needs to change. And we're in a sad state in America, again, because of just decisions that are made in our country. And so I'd like to talk about that this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, again for the opportunity to be in the house of God. Lord, we take time, Lord, and pray much during the service because, Lord, we want to have your blessing. We want to have your help. Holy Spirit of God, I ask for your power and I ask for your presence on the message this morning, Lord, and that you would help each and every one of us, that the truth would be heard, that we would take the truth, hear it, receive it, and apply it to our lives. Lord, may we understand, God, according to your word, you address every issue that we'll ever come up against in our, in our Christian's life. God, anything that we have questions about, there's an answer for in the Word of God. Lord, may we take your answer. Lord, may we apply it. Lord, may we understand what, you, what, you, what your mind is on that subject, Lord, and what we can do as Christians, Lord, to, to be more mindful of, your, of what you desire, Lord. May you help us, Lord, to understand this truth. Lord, we love you. Thank you, again. Thank you, Lord, again for the faithfulness of your people being in your house this morning. Would you bless us and bless all that's done and said. May it be for your honor and your glory. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When I see what is going on around our country and I see in the news things that happen, it reminds me of just really what a mess we're in. And I don't want to get up and be negative and preach doom and despair because God is good. Amen. Because our country is still the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Because we can go out and provide for our families and buy what is needed in food and all that God has blessed and provided us with. God is a good God this morning. Amen. And I love to be able to say that I am God's representative and that I get to serve an almighty God who is so good. Many people this morning are looking for God. They're not sure where to find Him. And I'm glad that I can be one to point them to Jesus Christ. Amen. What, how good that God is this morning. God's blessed me this week. I know, you know, I know that each and every one of us, if we'll take time to realize how much God really blesses us, we'd be a little more excited about who God is. Amen. We, got, we were able to get up this morning and breathe. You were able to look at the beautiful flowers and you would be able to drive down the road in a car and have gas in your vehicle. And how that so many in this country, or e even in this country but around the world, uh, wish they had what America has. How good that God's been to America. How good that God's been to us in not just providing for our needs but in giving us more than what we need. Amen. God has not only provided clothes on our back and shoes on our feet, but He's given us so much more than we ever deserve. How good that God is. But America has taken advantage of God's goodness and decided that no longer do we need God, that God has been so good to us that we've decided no longer do we need God, we can make our own decisions. What America's forgotten is that God blesses an obedient nation. Just like your children, when you have good children, that when you tell them what to do and they're obedient, you bless them for that. You buy them ice cream. You take them to the, to the store. You do things for them above and beyond the call of duty, so to speak. But when a child is disobedient, you take away some privileges. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't care for them. It means that they don't get some of the privileges that they would normally get. Well, I believe that in America... God is still going to take care of us for what we need, 
but God is slowly going to begin to take away some of the privileges that we've been blessed with because of our nation's disobedience to God and His Word. When you look out this last peak, last week, there were a couple of instances in the news. I don't know if you're aware of them, but there's a, an instance of... Uh, and this and this is more this is more than just one person. It happens all the time. But one of the ex NFL players went to a housewarming party and got mad at an argument and took his car and backed it into three people and then broke back into the house later. Got caught and was put on trial and got a hundred and fifty thousand dollar bond and they lowered it down to forty five thousand after he cried like a baby. But the judge finally said, I'm not lowering any different because he said that's the law. How sad in America when we've lost respect for human life. America is so pro-football, so pro-sports. And the same sports players turn around and use their car to injure people and break into houses and think that they're exempt from the law. You know why? Because they're, they're not in church when they're playing Sunday football. And our football that we've so exalted in America is teaching our children that it's okay to be above the law. That it's okay to do things anti-God. That's what the NFL is trying to teach our children. Sad in America. But the thing that really burdened my heart was when you look this last week, if you read in the newspaper, Target, I don't know if how many of you are aware of it, Target has now decided to put in their facilities transgender fitting rooms and transgender bathrooms. When you go into Walmart, or I mean Target, now you have to worry about ladies. If a man wants to walk in the bathroom with you, he can't. Now you have to worry about men. If a lady wants to walk in the bathroom, she can. Everything's transgender. My friend... How terrible that that is. How distressing that that is in America. You know why? Because God said that when He would return, it would be as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you're familiar with your Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis, they were a city of high wickedness. A city full of people anti-God. But the biggest thing, the kicker of it all in Sodom and Gomorrah was everybody, almost everybody, was either, was, it, was some form of a sodomite. Some form of homosexuality. God says that that's an abomination. And so when I see in America that we are now allow transgender it tells me Jesus is coming very soon. But that is disgusting. Can I say for those that will watch this video in the city of Wichita that that's wicked and that's wrong. And as a pastor, as a leader in a city, when I took this position to pastor, I not only pastored the people, but I represent a pastor for the city. And I have to get up and let known and be said that God is not happy with Wichita, Kansas. That God is not happy with America. That now we cater to sin instead of catering to God. Can I say to Target this morning that God is going to judge you like He did Sodom and Gomorrah? And can I say to America that when we allow that to happen, that God is going to judge us as a nation because now we think that we are greater than God and that we know better than God and that what God says is wrong is really okay. But my friend, that's not so. And as men and women, as children of God, we love everybody. But God says that we are to hate sin and we're to hate the effects of sin. Because I love people but what they don't realize by their decisions of sin is that they are bringing God's judgment on this country. And they are affecting the young people of our generation. You know why? Because the homosexual crowd cannot reproduce, so they have to recruit. Guess who they recruit? 
your children. Guess who they're after? Your children this morning. They want to teach your children it's okay to be anti-God. They want to teach your children it's okay to rebel and be prideful and walk the streets of America and steal and kill and destroy because that's what they're doing. Something needs to change this morning in America. America's got to change. Obama tried to tell us he would give us change because he said change should start in the White House. But we see that didn't work. We're now worse than what we were. We're now more in debt than what we were. We now have less jobs than what we had. And after eight years, the change that was promised is not the change that we were given. We were changed as, an Ameri as America, but it was the change that was hidden. It was a lie. And it's the change that has taken us farther from God as a nation. Can I tell you, the farther from God America goes, the less we're blessed. The farther from God America goes, the worse our country will get. The Bible says sin will wax worse and worse. Some will say, well, why is that a big deal? Because it's sin this morning. America has lost the understanding that that is sin, and sin is wrong. We want to say, well, let's cater to everybody. Let's make everybody feel good. Well, then in that case, let the prisons loose. Amen. Why do we have a prison? Because when you break the law, you deserve to go to jail. Because it's wrong. If we're going to cater to everybody, let the prison loose. Let them, run, let them run the city. Let them do whatever they want to. But this is the problem. America draws a line here because they know this is wrong. But they're slowly taking away what they know and they're slowly giving privileges to those that are in sin. Wickedness that they want to justify. God says it's all wicked and it's all wrong. They say, well, they're oppressed. Well, my friend, if you want to help the oppressed, shut down the abortion clinics. You want to help the oppressed this morning, shut down those clinics that kill innocent children. We want to help the oppressed this morning. How about you help those that are without food? How about you shut down the liquor? Because innocent boys and girls go without food and without clothes. I know, my dad was one of them. My grandpa would be out buying liquor and he'd go without shoes. You know why? Because anything that's sin is addictive. And it takes away from what's really important. America's lost sight. We want to help the oppressed this morning. Well, my friend, can I tell you that sin is not an oppression. Sin is a decision. Oppression is slavery. Oppression is racism. Oppression is not sin. They made a decision for sin. We want to help the oppressed. Well, if that's oppression then we shouldn't have a jail or a prison to put people in because that's oppression. Oppression is not, oppression is not putting out a judgment for, that, for wickedness. Oppression is giving freedom to do righteousness. But we say we're going to give privileges not for freedom's sake but for wickedness. My friend, can I remind you that Israel was blessed of God but when Israel allowed wickedness, like what we've allowed in our nation today, God judged them, and God allowed them to be conquered. My friend, can I tell you, I believe that if America continues to go down a road of wickedness, that we'll allow ourselves to be conquered as a nation. There will no longer be an America, because God will judge us. What's it going to take? Obama said it correctly that we do need change. However, Obama did not realize the change doesn't start in the White House. The Bible says it starts at the house of God. It starts with God's people in this room taking a stand for what is right and making a decision to teach the next generation. Don't neglect your children because they're the future. Teach them what's wrong. 
A lot of times we try to teach our children, well, it's okay, it's their decision. No, it's wrong. Okay. When somebody steals from the store, that's not okay. Well, it's their decision. No, it's wrong. It's, decision. it's their decision, but it's wrong. You don't do that. Okay. Homosexuality is wrong. It is their decision, but it's wrong. Because God says marriage is for one man and one woman only. That's what God intended. When America becomes so prideful and rebellious that we think we're okay to take what God made and do opposite with it is when God gets angry. That's why God calls it an abomination. In God's Word, there are things that God hates more than others. There are things that God says He hates more than other things. God does have a level of hate for wrong. One of those things is homosexuality. Because it takes everything that God created with a beautiful purpose and turns it into wickedness. You know who's behind that? The devil. That's what the devil did. The devil took what God had made and turned it around to not glorify God, but to bring shame to the name of Jehovah. And that's what that does. It takes what God intended for a beautiful purpose to produce children that would love and serve Him and instead turns it into a wicked lifestyle. That's why God hates it so much. That's why it's an abomination. Anything that you take and turn against God to bring Him shame. That's why God says pride is an abomination. Because God designed us to be humble. Not turn around and shake our fist at God and say, well, guess what, God, who cares? God says pride's an abomination to him. In the book of Proverbs is a list. He that soweth discord among the brethren, God says, is an abomination. And many more. But God says this is an abomination. Look it up in your Bible at what God calls an abomination. You'll see different things that God hates because God says it takes what he intended and turns it for wickedness. But as a city, we have to under, or as a pastor to the city, we have to understand it's wrong. Now we love everybody, and anybody can be saved. Praise God for that. The book of Corinthians says, and such were some of you, amen. America can be saved, people can be saved, but they have to know it's wrong. If we're not willing to make the hard decision, if your children aren't, if you're not willing to look at your children and tell them it's wrong, then you're not doing them a favor. Because then they'll grow up and be in that jail. In, in, the Hutchinson, in Hutchinson, there's a prison facility not far from our house, full of people that I know. You know why? Because a mom and a dad did not tell their children what's right and what's wrong. We'll let them make their own decisions. No, they don't know what decision to make. They need to be guided. They need to have somebody tell them no. That's what will save America. Amen. But Job chapter 5, verse number 8. I believe what can change America is what we are committed to. The word commitment, I believe if we take this word and understand what we should be committed to, I believe that we can change. When I think of the word commitment, I think of this man named Job. Job was a man of commitment. Some of you are familiar with Job. A good man. A godly man. The Bible says a man that escheweth evil. In other words, he hated wrong. He hated wickedness. And God therefore said he was a man that pleased the Lord. Because God also hates wickedness. Job was a good man. But he was a committed man. I found some things about Job that he was committed to that I think that we as Christians, if we'll take these things and commit ourselves and if America would listen and allow themselves to commit to some things that Job did I believe that we could have the same blessing that God gave Job. Job was a very blessed man. The Bible says he was the richest man in all the East. He had more than everybody. God had blessed him so much that he was not only famous he was very wealthy. I believe God has blessed America we are a very wealthy nation. We are a very famous nation because we were committed to these things at one time. But we've lost some things. We've gave up some ground. And I believe if we're going to change America and not allow these things to be this way, it starts at the house of God, and then America's got to get these things. 
and get our commitment back. The word commit means to roll, to deposit, to entrust. When you commit something, it's similar to like when you go to the bank and you make a deposit of your money and you put that in the bank's hands. You take, what, you take your money and give it to them and you commit it to them for their safekeeping. You commit it to them and by committing to them, you're showing your trust and your participation and approval of that, of that institution by committing to them. Well, I believe as Christians... We need to take ourselves and we need to make a spiritual deposit of ourselves into a few things. We need to commit ourselves into some things in America and stay committed. The word committed means when you make that deposit, you don't take it back. A lot of times what happens, the lack of commitment comes from when we commit ourselves to one thing and then when it doesn't go the way we should, we withdraw and deposit it somewhere else. Commitment means no matter what, you leave it there. That no matter what, your trust, your deposit stays where you put it. Things go wrong and things go bad and a lot of America has got to where we just withdraw quickly. But commitment is like through the Great Depression... When men and women stayed firm and were committed and gave themselves and fought for this nation, even when things were bad, they turned this nation around and, beca and we became a great nation. I believe we can do the same today. Number one, Job chapter 5, verse number 8, we saw, he said, I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause. I believe the first thing we need to do is be committed to a cause. One of the greatest problems in America is we are not committed to a cause. Well, let me rephrase that. We are committed to a cause, but not the right cause. America is committed to the cause of football. That's why football is played on Sunday, and the stadiums are full, and the churches are empty. That's why more football is watched on Sunday than preachers, or than the, than the pews are filled on Sunday. That's why, uh, that's why uh, so many are committed and we have posters and we have all these things and I'm all for football. I, I love to play. I love to tackle. You know, you don't play this flag football nonsense. Hey Amen. We tackle around here. Man, I love to play. Boy, I'm competitive. You ask my wife. I'm competitive. I don't like to lose. She played me in horse the other day and I won the first game. <laughs> She's a pretty good basketball player. And uh, so, but I don't like to lose. I'm competitive. So I, I, and I'm not against sports. I love it. But I'm against it when it takes the place of God. America's so become committed to athletics. Our sports programs and our public schools have, design, have, have trained our children to be so committed. When you think of a future, think of sports. Your children are trained to think in the public schools because they push it so much. Go to sports, go to sports. And if you're not in sports, you're not important. That's what they train you. Some of you know, if you're not an athlete, you're not the cool man. If you're not athletic, like your pastor. No, I'm kidding. If you're not athletic, then they train you to think that you don't have a purpose. Most, most young men grow up thinking if they can't go for, for football or basketball or baseball and they try so hard that then all of a sudden they're not important. God says God has a will for everybody in His Word and that everybody's important at the house of God. Not everybody is equal, but everybody is equally important at the house of God. But America has trained our, our children to think that if you can't do certain things, you're not valuable. It's how they think. You ask them, go to the public school. I've asked them. I've had teenagers. I've had to teach teenagers that if they're not involved in sports, that they're looked down upon because America's committed to a cause, but it's not the right cause. We've committed ourselves to train hard, build up our bodies to go show off on a field, but we can't sit down and read God's Word. How sad. America's also committed to the cause of money. You look around and many people are after the almighty dollar. 
And they're so after money that, we've, that they've neglected their families and neglected the house of God because we have to make money. We've become so committed to the dollar, thinking that we have to provide. But we forget that God made the money. God has made that piece of paper. God made the money that you earn. And God can provide you with it. And when you put God first, God will give back to you what you need. But too often we think, well, God can't provide, so I have to provide. It's a lack of faith. But it's because America's become so committed to that. America says if you're not wealthy, you're not successful. That's how they think. No longer is it you're successful if you have a family and you have children that love and honor God. No longer are you successful if you've taken care of your family and provided for it. No, we look at those that are wealthy, that have taken their families and cheat on their wives and don't provide for their children, but we think they're successful. They've got money. One of those men that's so, that's, that's so thought of as successful was Kobe Bryant. Plays for the Los Angeles Lakers. Can I tell you, that man's not successful. Cheated on his wife doesn't take care of his children, makes millions and millions of dollars, but yet still finds himself that, he, that he's above God and can be unfaithful. Can I tell you he's wrong? And that's not success. Success is not a measured by the amount of money you have in the bank, but by the integrity that you hold in your heart. Teach your children to understand you may not be wealthy, but when you bring your children and your families to the house of God and you love them and provide for them and take care of your family, that's success. God says somebody that doesn't take care of their family is worse than an infidel. When God looks down and sees you taking care of your home and providing, God takes pleasure in that. Sad when America becomes so committed to the cause of money. And the Bible says money is the root of all evil. We'll invest our money in America and everything else, but we won't invest in the house of God. We won't invest in the things of God. We'll invest in stocks. America will invest in, in Planned Parenthood, but we won't invest in church because America's become committed to money. Sad. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I love that verse. Take it and memorize it. Because he says, For the which cause, the cause of Jesus Christ, he, Paul said, I suffer these things. But guess what? He says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to suffer for God because it's a worthy cause. Amen. May we get to where as Christians we're not ashamed to suffer reproach, suffer shame for the cross, but we would say I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We need to be committed to the cause of Christ. We need to be committed to the cause of Jesus Christ giving the gospel of the local church and all of those things. Number two, we'll hurry. We need to be committed to Jesus Christ Himself. Job chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Committed to Christ. Job 2, 9 and 10. We find that something about Job. We read this here. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Job had a hard time that came. If you're not familiar with Job, he was very wealthy, and God decided to test Job and took everything that Job had and left him with nothing but the clothes on his back and his family and enough food to make it through the day. Job lost everything. His wife got so discouraged, she said, Job, you ought to curse God and die. Wow. How sad when we as people get to a point where we decide we ought to just curse God. You know, that's what America's done. America blames God for everything. 
Well, things aren't going well. Must mean, must mean God hates me. Things aren't going the way I wanted to. You woke up and you breathed this morning. You woke up, you had money to take care of your family, didn't you? You had a house over your head, shoes on your feet. Well, God must hate me. I don't have a nice car. That's how America looks at it. Tough times come. Maybe when things get a little bit tight, we begin to blame God, just like Job's wife. A lot of people have Job's wife's attitude. They have a Job wife attitude. Curse God and die! Sad in America. Job was committed to Jesus. Job said, look, if things go well or if things go bad, he's done more for me than I've ever had. He said, I'll not give up and I'll not give in. God is good and God always wins. God will take care of you this morning. If you're saved and born again, God's already given you more than you deserve. So what if maybe you don't have everything you need? You've got a home in heaven. Or I mean everything that you want. God will give you what you need. I promise you there'll be food. I promise you that God will take care of you. God always has and God always will. But don't begin to blame God. We're so uncommitted to Christ in America that we begin as, uh, when any problems come. And it's funny how that nobody believes in God till problems come. And then everybody wants to blame God. Well, it's God's fault. When things are going good, well, I don't really believe that God stuff. You know, but then when problems come, they come to church. Well, see, it's really God's fault. Isn't that funny how that works? We're quick to blame God. We don't want to trust God, but we'll blame Him when problems come. Christians don't want to trust God with their money, but then they blame God. Well, God, things are tight. How come we're not making it? God says, did you tie? Did you trust me first? We're so quick to add God to our problems when the problems come. But when the good times are there, we'll leave God alone. When everything's going good, we'll skip out on church. But when things are going bad, we want to come and say, Well, God, where were you? God says, Where were you? He said, I took a head count in church this morning. You were on the couch. Well, I had church at home. God says, right. God says, you must not read your Bible very well. Because you ever notice that the Bible, when it talks about church, and I'll give you a thought like this. I was studying my Bible and God gave this to me. When the Bible talks about church, it's always in reference to a group. Because it's a called out assembly. People, when you're at home flipping the channels, you're not in a group. You're by yourself. And you're not called out. So to say I have church at home is ignorant because church means you come out and you gather with somebody. And God says where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. So you can't have church at home. You can't stay at home and say I had church this morning and expect God to bless you. God says you honor Christ. You be committed to Christ. Job said I will not. Job said it's foolish. He called his wife. He said, you're as one of the foolish women. It's foolish to curse God. It's foolish to blame God. It's foolish to act that God doesn't care when God really does. Be committed to Christ this morning. Don't let the world try to make you think that God's to blame for all your problems. God wants to take care of your problems. The world is the one that gives us the problems and then tells us to blame God for them. Sad. Number three, Job was committed to his family. Look at Job chapter 1, verse number 5. It says, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. And then look, Job chapter 23, verse 10 and 13. Job 23, 10 and 13. It says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. 
but he is in one mind. Who can turn him and what his soul desireth, even that he doeth? For he performeth the thing that is appointed to me, and many such things are with him. And then you keep going, and we won't read the rest. But it talks about how that he, even his wife, he still took care of her. God blessed her with more children. And at the end, and, and, and at the end of the end of the book of Job, God gives him more children, and Job still took care of his wife. Even though his wife told him to curse God and die, he still took care of her and brought her back. We need to be committed in America to not just God, not just the cause of Christ, but I believe to our families. You need to be committed to your spouse this morning. Job was committed to his wife. Don't let the devil get in between you and your spouse. This generation has gone crazy with cheating, with divorce, and a lack of respect for the marriage bounds. Very, it's, it's a sad state that America's come to. We no longer care that you said I do to one person. We no longer care about the ring on a finger. People no longer care that you gave your life and committed yourself and deposited yourself to one person. They want you to take a withdrawal and deposit to them. They don't care that you said I do for a lifetime, not for a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you the problem in America is we're not committed to our spouses. Don't you let the devil get in between and cause you to get on the internet like so many do and look at other women or look at other men, or get on social media and chat with other people and allow them to put a wedge between you and your spouse. Don't you let the devil get in there. Don't you let the devil get in there and cause you to be unfaithful. You've given your life to that woman. You've given your life to that man. They've, they've been with you. Don't you dare get out there and commit adultery. Don't let the devil get in there and make you think that. Men, don't let some hussy walk by, try to grab your attention and make you think that, you, that she's not worthy of your trust and you ought to give it to her. Buddy, you ought to turn your head. Buddy, we ought to take our time and commit to our wives. And when somebody walks by and tries to get your attention, that's what you do. You reach over and bend your wife back, give her a good old smoocher. Amen. Amen. That's what I do. We go walking through Walmart. Somebody will walk by and my wife will notice and they'll be trying to do whatever flaunt themselves, I'll reach over and just... Mm -mm. I've done that before. You know why? I want people to know I'm committed to my spouse. I didn't say I do to her to turn around and, and don't. So many say, well, I do, and then they don't. I do to you, and they never do. God forbid. You take care of that woman. You love her. You honor her. You keep her. Amen? Lady, take care of your husband. Honor him. Take care of him. Provide for him. And give, him give him what he's needed. Amen? Don't take the affection and give it to somebody else. We're not, we're not committed to our spouses like we should. I believe America's run ragged and sick. That women think they've got to attract every other husband. Let it not be said in our church that we do that. Let it not be said of you and your family that you did do that. Amen. Be committed to your spouse this morning. Job was committed. He didn't let his wife discourage him to the point where he said, well, maybe I should get another one. You know, your wife is going to have faults. Your husband's going to have faults. They're going to fail. You keep that commitment. The commitment wasn't given to them when bad times come and then it stops it was till death do us part when you make that commitment you keep that we also need to be committed to our children as mothers and fathers we need to be committed to the children that God gave you God has entrusted you with beautiful children beautiful children in this church God has entrusted you with children whether they're yours or adopted they are entrusted, the Bible says. They are a gift from God. We need to make sure that we take care of them and love them and provide for them. And many of you do, and I'm thankful for that. But in America, it's become rampant that we'll neglect our children to get what we want. We'll, achieve, we'll go after our goals and leave our children uncared for. How many times have I seen it? A child goes without shoes or clothes 
or a child goes without what he needs. Why? So we can go and party. My, my wife and I, we know someone personally, very close to us, that instead of taking care of their child, their child is babysat so they can go party. Their child is left with somebody else so they can go have fun with friends. God forbid. You take care of that child. You take time and you play with them and you love them. One day they won't be there. Will they know that you invested? One day they won't be there. Will they be able to say, I had a mom and dad that loved me? Or my dad was more concerned with himself, with his own goals, with his own achievements? Job took time and sacrificed for his children because he said, if my children have sinned, he wanted to make sure that he would take time for them and show them that he had, they had a dad who loved them and loved God. The most important thing your children ought to know is they have a mom and dad that love the Lord Jesus Christ. The most important thing your children ought to know is that mom and dad were in church. Mom and dad were at the prayer meeting. Mom and dad took time at the house of God and took me and trained me that church is important. They ought to have a mom and dad that teach them that church is more important. When other activities come up, we don't skip out on church. Amen. And many of you do, and what a blessing that it is. But it's become rampant in America, and I want to make sure that America understands that there's an old-fashioned preacher in Wichita, Kansas, that says you're doing your children wrong by taking them to a football game on Sunday and not to church. I want America to know it's wrong. Maybe it's not popular, but it's wrong. Love your children this morning. Give them the time that they need. Take care of them. Honor them. America's trying to push children to replace God with a personal gratification. America's trying to push your children to replace God in their life with satisfying their own desires. And that's why we've turned into the mess that we are. You teach your chil you you love your children this morning. Amen. You take care of those kids. God bless for our children. The Bible says that children, like I said, are a gift from the Lord. And the Bible says that they're like an arrow in the hand of a, of a bowman. Where you point your children is where they'll go. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. If you point your children this morning to sports, that's where they'll go. If you point your children this morning to money, that's where they'll go. But if you take your children, you'll point them to an almighty God. They'll go to God. They may not always be what they should, but God says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. You watch. They'll turn around. Maybe they've displeased you, but they'll turn around. They'll come back to God. But the biggest blessing is that your children are born again. The most important reason to keep your children in the house of God is because one day they'll walk an old-fashioned aisle and trust Jesus as their Savior. Because one day they'll accept Jesus Christ and be given a home in heaven. Well, that's the most blessed thing ever, to know that one day you'll spend eternity with your children. There are parents that I know that weep and cry at the side of a bed because they didn't teach their children to love God and their children are lost this morning. Let your children be in the house of God. May they know that you love the Lord. May you point them to Jesus this morning. Amen. We need to be committed in America. Are you committed to the house of God? My friend, what are you committed to? Because remember, in closing, that commitment always results in action. What you're committed to will cause you to act. That's why people that are committed to all of the things, sports, money, all of those things, they're committed to that, so they act upon it. When you're committed to the house of God, it comes out in how you act. It comes out in what you invest. If you invest yourself, then you're committed. But if you invest in other things, what you've done is you've taken yourself and made a spiritual deposit and entrusted them with yourself. Just like the bank, when you commit your money to the bank, you realize, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, you realize they take your money and they use it. 
Now, they, it's there for you, but they use it. They invest in things. that they, they take it and use it for themselves. So what you've taken a part of you and let them use it. When you make a spiritual deposit of yourself to something, they'll use it. You realize you take a part of yourself or your family and you deposit, you commit to that, they'll use it. People wonder, why am I having so many problems? What have you entrusted yourself to? You commit to the house of God, you commit yourself to God, and you deposit yourself and entrust your life to God, God will use it. You'll get a return investment. You'll get a great return. We we'll talk about that tonight. How that you get a return. The world does not provide a return. They take it and never give back. God takes what you've given to Him and gives you a return on your investment. That's why when you tithe, God promises, I will give back. I will. He says that your cup will run over. But when you invest in the world, you ask many that have invested in this old world, and they'll tell you they've never gotten back. They've lost. Amen. What are you committed to this morning? What have you entrust, deposited yourself into? Some of us need to entrust God this morning, maybe with our souls. We've not taken that first step of faith and entrusted our soul to God. Paul said for I, in 2 Timothy 1.12, and I'll read it one more time. He said, For the which cause I also suffer these things, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What Paul was talking about was his soul. He committed his soul to Jesus and he said, I know that Jesus promised eternal life, and I know that he'll keep eternal life. God doesn't go back on his promise. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're given a home in heaven, and God promises he'll give you that home. Some of us have not committed that first step to God. Maybe this morning you're not born again. You've not entrusted yourself to Jesus. You've not put your faith and trust in Jesus to go to heaven this morning. That's the first step. Amen. That's that, that's that key that opens the door. Amen. Starts by faith. And some of us this morning need to commit ourselves more to the house of God. Some of us need to deposit ourselves more to the Lord this morning. We need to withdraw what we have invested in and put it back in Jesus. We've invested so much in the world and you've not gotten a return. Take that back. Start giving it to God. Start over. Give it back to God. Watch God do something. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, as we come.